what's changed since we arrived at these talks? Well, things are very fluid, actually. There's some very bad signs of things going wrong, but some quite optimistic signs of other things going quite well. But it's changing on a day-to-day -day basis. One of the things that I think has really changed is something uh, which is very frustrating to do with the establishment of the Green Climate Fund. And that was a key thing that needed to be agreed here and just wrapped up. It should have been a slam dunk. And unfortunately, because uh, a couple of countries, the US and Saudi Arabia, objected to some technical issues around, around the, the report for the way this was going to function, the, net, the risk is now that it could be completely opened up again. We thought we had a compromise package for that that would have been a, basically rubber stamped. There's a danger that that could open the whole thing up. Now, the consequences of that would be really bad. We need this fund set up urgently and we need money to flow into the fund urgently to really get action in developing countries going now to help the most vulnerable people who are already being hit by climate change to help protect the forests to help get clean energy investment going in developing countries and how do you see that moving forward into so, so, so i might actually take this question to make it interesting okay <laughs> Ooh, crazy <laughs> how do you see that moving forward in week two now that the green climate fund appears to be at risk so, I mean, I think this is one of those things that we need to see resolved really as soon as possible because the danger is that it holds up progress on other issues and becomes a bargaining chip. It, we fear it may end up going to, onto the intro of the ministers when they start to arrive next week for resolution at the, at the end game of next week. But the concern is that that may hold things up elsewhere. One of the other big talking points here, of course, was the Coyote Protocol and the future of the Coyote Protocol. How has that moved forward? One of the headline grabbing things this week was the, the, the media reporting that Canada is deciding not just to fail to agree to the second commitment period of Kyoto, but to actually step out of its existing commitments under Kyoto. Canada is now refusing to confirm or deny this rumour. However, if confirmed, it would be really devastatingly unhelpful to, uh, to the mood. It's certainly hard to see how Canada could be could hold its head up as a member of the international community with this sort of behaviour. We, um, for, in other contexts, we are seeing positive signals from the EU about the need to move on uh, and the, the EU's willingness to ratify the second commitment period. We need them to be much clearer about that. Um, and really coming out strongly in support of the, the, the Kyoto Protocol and a, a five-year commitment period. Why a five-year commitment period? Because the concern is that we need to be able to, to keep increasing ambition. If we lock in a long period with low ambition, we're going to miss that really important timetable for peaking global emissions. So we need a short period, we need the EU to get strong in it, and we need, equally importantly, a mandate to get a comprehensive agreement building on that second commitment period. That mandate's got to reach an agreement in 2015, and that's got to come into force at the start of 2018. That's the only way we can really get the ambition that we need to get the global emissions under control. Politicians are coming to, to the talks. Can you just give our viewers an idea of what they're going to be doing here? So a lot of these big, the really, really big issues uh, always end up on uh, politicians in trays. So there's a, a lot of text flying around and officials beavering away on the details of the text, but they have what they call square brackets around all the interesting things where in the text you've got different positions in square brackets and wildly different positions from different countries. The really crunchy issues will get passed up to the, the, the politicians to have some hard negotiating, hard banging heads together we hope hopefully uh, the, the people who are really trying to get a good outcome will be pushing the hardest to secure that um, and to there will have to be compromises all around um, but they, will, they really need to deal with the big issues the big issues will be sorting out the, the, um, the, the climate fund sorting out an agreement on the sources of finance to make sure that there's money to go into the fund so it's not just an empty vessel um, and also critically agreeing on the future of the Kyoto Protocol uh, and also the, 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 the pathway to a more comprehensive legally binding agreement shortly after. Um, the other thing that we think they really need to get real about is actually the urgency of the ambition and the science. The current pledges that are on the table, even if implemented in full, leave us miles away from a safe climate trajectory. It's not just NGOs saying that. Some of the world's leading in the, you know, authoritative institutions, such as the United Nations Environment Programme, the International Energy Agency, who are not renowned for being tree huggers, are saying that we need to see global emissions peaking really at the middle of this decade at the latest, otherwise we are heading in for a very, very dangerous future. 
So that needs, there needs to be a clear steer for ministers to get real on ambition and agree a process to ratchet up the targets now. Okay, thanks for speaking to us, Keith, and maybe we'll catch up with you next week as well. Thank you. Cheers.